God. Praise our awesome Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And today, praises to the Holy Spirit, who is the power of God within us. As I always let you know, I am Minister Sharon Savage, and I'm with Walk by Faith Ministries. I am so excited today to begin a new series. This month and next month, I'm going to be talking about the eternal resting place called heaven. It is so important that we come to understand as people of God and even those of you who may be watching and you're not born again, believers in Jesus Christ, that there is an eternity for all of us in this world. We can make a choice today as to where we spend that eternity. I'm going to go through some things in the Word of God over the next few weeks because it's important that we understand that we're all going to leave this earth one day. We will go into the ground one day, but there are when we are resurrected, all of us will be resurrected one day. When Jesus comes back, he's going to come back for his church. The Bible says a church without spot, without wrinkle, which means that we have to grow into the knowledge of Jesus Christ, develop that relationship with him, and be changed into his likeness so that we become that church that he comes back for without spot or wrinkle. But what most people don't understand, and I'm going to teach over the next few weeks, is that every soul, everyone who goes into the earth will be resurrected one day. But the choice has to be made now. The choice has to be made while we are alive. The choice has to be made as to whether we spend an eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I'm going to describe heaven to you as I go through this series. Or whether we spend an eternity in hell with the devil and his demons. Now, it's as simple as that. There are times that people uh, smooth it over. There are times that people try to make it sound pleasant. But there is an engrafted word of God that I'm going to be teaching today and over the next few weeks, as I've said over and over again, on heaven, our eternal resting place. That is where we desire to go. The Bible talks about hell. It says that it is a place where the fires never go out and the worms never stop eating your flesh. That is not a place that I would wish even on those people that consider themselves enemies of mine. I'm hoping that through this series that you get a clearer understanding because so many pastors, so many bishops, elders, people in the church don't talk about this anymore. When I was a child, I had a pastor that was a, a mentor of mine. He was a wonderful, powerful man of God. And he used to talk about this eternal resting place. He used to talk about the opposite of this eternal resting place. And there are people that receive Jesus Christ simply because of the teachings. And so I'm hoping that as I go through this, that you will get a clearer understanding in your mind. You will get a clearer understanding in your heart. And if you are outside of the will of God, this will be a decision that you will make during this time to get your life in order. To get And by getting it in order, I mean you cannot do anything aside from the working of the Holy Spirit. By getting your life in order, the first thing is to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So let me start with the lesson today, Heaven, Our Eternal Resting Place. So many people in the body of Christ desire to know more about heaven and what we can expect as born-again believers and how to get to this final resting place we have been promised. Is heaven a guarantee if you are saved through Jesus Christ? Mm. The Bible tells us, and Paul said it very eloquently in the scriptures, that there is a life that we must live. Being saved means that you are saved from the penalty of death. When you receive salvation and you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you at that moment receive salvation. Now, the Apostle Peter says, at that moment the Holy Spirit comes into your heart. The Holy Spirit comes to direct you. It comes to reproof you, which is, uh, is to correct you. He comes to rebuke you, to instruct you on what you must do in order to get into heaven one day. The Apostle Paul also admonished or he warned people, you cannot continue to live a life of sin even after you confess Jesus Christ 
and believe that heaven is waiting for you one day. Galatians tells us, Galatians chapter 5 says, there are certain things, fornication, there's lying, there are other things that have no place in the kingdom of God. That is in this life and also the life to come. So I'm going to clear up a lot of myths. I'm going to bring a greater understanding that we must also live a life that glorifies God if we're going to get into heaven one day. If we fall short, and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, because Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And what that means is that when we fall short, we've backslidden. And those of you that are backslidden, today is your day. This month is your month. The next few weeks are your time. To get back into that right standing with the Lord. We know that it is through Jesus Christ that we have come into a reconciliation with God. We know that through Adam in the Garden of Eden, mankind fell. So all of mankind fell. That's where sin came into the world through Adam. But we also know that through Jesus Christ, God reconciled us, brought us back near him. He brought us back so that we can be in his presence. Hallelujah. He brought us back so that we no longer need a priest in order to go to God for us. That now that the veil was torn when Jesus was crucified on the cross of Calvary over 2,000 years ago, that that veil was opened up and the Holy of Holies was opened up to all of those who have given their lives to Jesus Christ. We need only to go beyond the veil, go into that place, sup with the Lord, fellowship with him so that we can be changed into the likeness that Jesus Christ showed us when he came into the earth. Heaven and hell are both a reality, whether you believe it or not. Heaven and hell are both a reality. I'm going to start with the narrow road to heaven. I'll be talking about also the gulf between the dead and the living at some point. I will be talking about the place that Jesus has prepared for us. And then I'm going to go into, not today, but through this series, God's requirements for us to enter into his kingdom. I'm talking about his eternal kingdom called heaven. I'm also going to share with you where is the kingdom of God now. The Bible says that when Jesus came and he walked the earth, he said, the kingdom of heaven is now here. So we live currently, if you're a born again believer in Jesus Christ, in this kingdom, this heavenly kingdom that's here on earth, that's above every prince, every king, every premier, every um, uh, leader of nations in this world. So we also are now living above this world. I'm going to also talk with you about how we can live in this kingdom above all of the earth. So let's start with Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to look specifically at verses 13 to 14. Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 to 14. Hallelujah. I believe I'm giving you enough time to turn there. So let's start right there. The Bible reads, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by, who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult, listen to this, is the way which leads to life. Jesus is talking about eternal life. And he says, and there are few who find it. Wow. There are few who find this narrow road to heaven. The world is so broad. It's, there are so many people and there are so many different religions in the world today. But there is only one true religion and that is the one that comes through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When you look at the scriptures, if you go back, and I'm not telling you to turn there, I'm just going to give you a little bit of history. When Jesus began to walk the earth in his ministry, we know that Jesus Christ came in through a virgin birth, through his mother Mary, because the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, and Mary was impregnated with Jesus Christ. When Jesus began, he grew and he became, um, how do I say it? He gained favor, the Bible says, with the Lord and with man. At the age of 30, 
This is a history lesson for you today. At the age of 30, God brought Jesus forth. Jesus was born into the Jewish culture. He brought him forth in his kingship. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the savior of the world. The Jews understood that at the age of 30, you were considered um, uh, fully grown. You were considered a man. You were considered uh, to be in your purpose at that time. So that's why God brought him forth at the age of 30. Jesus ministered in the earth uh, publicly for three and a half years until he went to the cross of Calvary. When he came out into his ministry, God sent him into the wilderness so that he would be ministered to by angels and he would be able to resist the devil. When he comes out of that, he begins his public ministry starting in Matthew chapter 4. When we get to Matthew chapters 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, which I started today, Jesus was telling them about this new covenant. He was telling them about what is a requirement now. The old covenant, he has fulfilled that. It, it was not done away with. He fulfilled it for those of us who are in him today, who have given our lives to Jesus Christ. So he's telling them what the new rules are. In other words, so this that I just read to you in Matthew chapter 7 is a part of the new rule. He's telling us that there is a narrow way to get to heaven one day. Just because you are saved does not mean that you automatically will go to heaven. I know I've heard preachers talk about that. That is not a guarantee. We have to live our lives according to the word of God. And that's how we get to heaven one day. And so there are so many scriptures that mention heaven. The place that all born again believers desire. That's where we desire to go when this life here on earth is finished. There is the eternal life that Jesus spoke of to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. So we're going to go a little bit further in the Bible to John chapter 3. And we're going to look at verses 10 through 17. For those of you that are new to the word of God, there is the, the book, the Gospels. In the first four books of the New Testament, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so I've gone to John chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. I believe you've had enough time to turn there. This is the story of Nicodemus, who was a member of the Sanhedrin. Nicodemus went to Jesus, and the Sanhedrin was the ruling council of the Jews at that time. Nicodemus went to Jesus, and the Bible says that he went at night under cup where nobody else could see him. And Jesus said, and Nicodemus said, Jesus, look, all of these signs and wonders, all of these things that you've done, he says, you would have to have come from God. And Jesus answered Nicodemus and he said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus was confused. He said, how is it that I can be born again? I was born once. How is it that I can be born again? And Jesus tells Nicodemus, there is a rebirth. The first is through water. You came through your mother's womb. And he says, but the second birth is a spiritual birth. Hallelujah. He says, you have to be born of the spirit. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And so Nicodemus said, how can these things be? And that's where I am right now in the scripture. In John chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? He said, Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. He said the Sanhedrin, he's talking about them in general, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Nicodemus was a Sadducee. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, you don't receive our witness. He said, if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? This is what I'm doing with you all today. He said, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven. He said, that is the son of man who is in heaven. He says, I came down from heaven to show the way. I came down from heaven to let you know what is the requirement for you to be with me in heaven one day. He says, 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is the life that we want, the eternal life, that eternal Zoe that Jesus has given us here on earth. And so he's talking about being lifted up on the cross so that all would see that he is the Savior of the world. And then he goes on, my favorite scripture, one of my favorite scriptures. I have so many favorite scriptures in the Bible, but this is one that I learned as a child. And that is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus prepared his disciples. He prepared his disciples for his return that he was leaving him. As I said, there's so much scripture in the Bible that talks about that. In John chapter 14, you don't have to turn there, verses 1 through 6, Jesus said, he is the only way to the Father. He told his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. He told them that he was going away and they were troubled. They were like, Jesus, where are you going? He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also, he said, in me. There is more than enough room in my father's house. Um, some versions of that, of that scripture say there are many mansions and people think they're going to be living in this house that's a mansion. But no, there will be so many millions and billions of us there. He says, but there's so much, uh, still enough room for everybody through generations who have come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He told his disciple, disciples, if it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I, if I go to prepare that place for you, which he has already done, he's doing it now. I will return. He says, when everything is ready, I will come get you so that you will be with me always. Where I am, that you will be too. That is heaven, our eternal resting place. Hallelujah. Thomas and both Philip challenged him and he said, you know, I've been with you all this time. I want to share with you that some of you who are watching, listening today, have been with Jesus for a long time, but still don't know the way to heaven. Don't understand that there is an eternal resting place for us one day, and that place is called heaven. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And then he answered Philip. I'm Thomas, and then Philip challenged him also. He said, Philip, have you been with me all this time and you still don't understand it? This is why I'm teaching this series. Have you been with the Lord all this time and you still don't understand? There is a way, there is a truth, and there is the life. And Jesus said, I'm it. He is the only way to heaven. I have seen so many people in so much of my travels, especially in Africa, where I have done open air crusades so many years, for so many years. And then when the music starts, I would see people out there in the open air crusades dancing. I would hear songs about God and songs about the scripture, and I would see people uh, singing those songs. But at the end of it, when I would offer Jesus to them, and I would say, he is the only way to heaven. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is your day. Many of the people who would be singing and dancing and quoting scripture had not given their lives to Jesus Christ. They would be the first ones at the altar. I want to receive Jesus. I would tell them he's the best gift that I have to offer you. And I'm saying that to you today. He is the best gift that I have to offer you. When I go through Africa, I've gone through India, I've gone through other places. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except by me. Hallelujah. He told them that, that they have to be born again, but there is a way that we live. At the time of Jesus' crucifixion, there was a criminal on the cross next to him. He was promised a place in heaven that same day by Jesus Christ. And we find that in Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. Again, as I said, the first four Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So you have to turn back a little bit to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 23, verses 39 and 43. 
The Bible says, then one of the criminals who was hanged blasphemed him. So there were two. on. One was on the left, one was on the right. If you are the Christ, this one said, save yourself and us. But the other one answering rebuked that first one saying, do you not even fear God? Seeing you are under the same condemnation. And he said, we indeed are justly getting what we deserve. For we receive the due reward for the things that we have done. But this man, Jesus, hallelujah, has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. He was talking about heaven. He was talking about the paradise. He was talking about the Eden. That word paradise means Eden. It's just like the Eden that God set up here on earth when he put Adam and Eve in there and they and Adam failed him. And so now this Eden is now in heaven. It's called paradise. It is where there's no more crying. There's no more tears. Hallelujah. There's no more pain. Uh, there is just the praise and the worship of the Lord every single day. As God met Adam in the cool of the evening every day in fellowship with him, we will have an eternal fellowship with God in heaven. So what is heaven like? What is heaven like? I'm going to go through some of these very quickly. Heaven is the paradise that Jesus prepared for his born again believers. Heaven is a city. And it is occupied by innumerable angels. There are so many angels that we could not ever count them. That's where they are today. Angels are in heaven. There are times that God sends angels forth to minister to us here on the earth. But they are, there are so many angels. Let me clarify something for you. These angels were created from the foundation of the world. These angels were there at the foundation of the world. So there are people that say, well, my mother has gone on to be with the Lord and she's now an angel in heaven. Your mother, your father, those who are deceased are not those angels that are in heaven. These are the angels that God created from the very beginning. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 24, let me go back to what I was just saying. The Bible says that one day we will be just like Jesus. We will have glorified bodies and we will be just like those angels in heaven. The Bible does not say we will be angels in heaven. We will be just like Jesus in his glorified body. When we are resurrected one day, the resurrected what, what um, blood washed soul will reunite with a glorified body and will reunite with the spirit, whew, the Ruach that God breathed into man to make him a living creature to begin with, and then we will go through the rapture to be with Jesus Christ. But heaven is a city, and it has so many angels you cannot number them. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 to 24 says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than of Abel. Uh, the Hebrews writer says that that's where we're going one day. Hallelujah. The second thing is heaven is the house of the throne room of God. In John chapter 14, I just read that to you, verse 2. It is the throne room of God. Praise God. That's where God is today. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is at the right hand of God the Father in heavenly places. And because we are in the kingdom of God, we are seated in heavenly places at the right hand of God today. I'll be talking about that as we go forward. So I want you to stay tuned always as I'm going through this series because I'll cover that very shortly. Heaven has many mansions, many rooms. Enough for all of the saints. I just read that in John chapter 14, verse 2. Many rooms. The fourth thing is heaven is restoration of the Garden of Eden. I explained that to you in the spirit realm. We find that in Luke 23, 43. We find that in Revelation uh, chapter 2, verse 7. 
and also 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Revelation 2, 7 says, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. This is the Holy Spirit. He's not an it. He is a he. He is the third person of the Trinity. And John in Revelation said, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Holy Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. He's talking about worldwide. To everyone who is victorious, I will give him fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. That's what our aim is. Everyone who is victorious in this earth, Jesus said, you will have trials. You will have tri tribulations in this world. He said, but be of good cheer. I have overcome this world. Those of us that are victorious, we've overcome death, even death. The Bible says, death, where is your sting? Hallelujah. We will have life eternally in heaven with Jesus Christ one day. Hallelujah. Paul talked about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I won't be able to read that to you, verses 1 through 4. You can write that down. Paul said that God took him into paradise one day, took him into heaven one day. He said, whether I was in my body, whether he took me bodily, or he took me in the spirit, maybe I was out of my body, I don't know. He said, but what I saw, I could not even describe it. I couldn't put it into words. And that's how we will be one day when we get there with Jesus Christ. Heaven is a kingdom. That's the fifth thing. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 10, the Bible says that when God gathers, when Jesus comes, hallelujah, he is coming with a kingdom, hallelujah. Heaven is a kingdom. James chapter 2, verse 5 talks about the kingdom of God. Heaven is eternal. The next thing is that heaven is eternal. In 2 Peter Chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, Peter the Apostle said, So, dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. We must work out our salvation daily. What that means is we must live a life that God has required us to live in obedience to him, obeying his commandments, hallelujah, to be sure that we are called and chosen of God. Peter says, do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Heaven is an inheritance of the saints. That's the next thing I want you to know. It's an inheritance of the saints of God. Those who are chosen, the remnant that remain, those that continue to obey God and do God's will. Hebrews 9.15 tells us that, and 1 Peter 1 verse 4 tells us that. The next thing is that heaven is a better country. The Hebrews writer in Hebrews 11 verses 14 through 16 said, Even our patriarchs, the ones in the Old Testament where people ask, oh, Will they be in heaven with us one day? Because Jesus Christ had not come down into the earth at that time. So how could they be saved through Jesus Christ? Mm. The Hebrews writer tells us in Hebrews 11, it was by their faith. Hallelujah. It was by their faith. Jesus even said to his disciples before he left, he said, One day you will sit around the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus said that means that they will be in heaven one day. And we will sit at the table with these patriarchs one day. Hallelujah. They saw it as a better country. They didn't look back to where they had come from, but they looked back, they looked forward to what they knew that Jesus that God had revealed to them was a better place. Heaven is a place where there will be no marriage. We will get there on our own beliefs, on our own um the work that we do that shows our faith, we will get there on that. Heaven is a place where there will be no more suffering. The evil one will not be able to touch us. Heaven is a place where we will have new bodies. Our old corrupt bodies will be transformed into incorruptible bodies. Hallelujah. Praise God. Heaven is a place of safety. Heaven is a place of eternal rest from our labors. That is our reward. Being changed into the likeness of Jesus Christ is where we're aiming to be today and heaven is the reward for that. 
Heaven is a place of rewards of different levels. There are times in the Bible where Jesus said, Great will your reward be in heaven. Great will your reward be in heaven. Those that lead others to Christ greatest, hallelujah, will be your reward in heaven. And heaven is a place, finally, that has been especially prepared for God's people who have remained faithful to Him. That is the key. Our faithfulness to God, our Father, to Jesus Christ, the, uh, the Son of God, and our faithfulness in listening and obeying the work of the kingdom through the Holy Spirit. I want you to stay tuned for the next program. There is always more to come.